start since we're a couple minutes over already, but great question, thank you. Um, top cancer fighting food. So one of my favorite classes, I got to give this presentation not too long ago to uh, Dominion Power, like 300 and something employees, it was this big deal. Um, and so that's why it has the Rosemont Chiropractic on the bottom. I know you guys know where we are right now, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, so it was a big, big talk. And so I've taken in, I've tweaked that talk a little bit um, and added a couple little things to it because this is the fourth year now I've been doing this class. So when I get something new, I, I put it in there and add it as we go. So we're going to take a couple minutes. I'm going to talk about uh, what cancer is. I'm going to talk about some concepts about cancer that we have to understand that we've forgotten. And I'm going to talk about some things that we can do with foods, simple foods, um, superfoods, powerful foods that we can use that will help us stay healthier and prevent our chances potentially of having cancer in the future. Okay? So we know there's things out there that decrease your chances of having cancer. And when you put them all together, it's a pretty simple but very powerful message that we get when we look at it in an objective way rather than putting our heads into finite little pieces of how to cure a cancer. Does that make sense? So we take, we're going to be looking at more of a big picture of this stuff instead of all the little details of it. So the key, everything, can we agree that it's better to not get cancer than have to worry about treating cancer? Does everybody agree to that? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. And that's true for every disease, isn't it? It will be much easier to just prevent heart disease than look for a cure for heart disease. And unfortunately, with all diseases, that kill us and get us sick. There's all kinds of treatments of symptoms of these things, but there's no cures, is there? No, there's no cure. The only thing we have is prevention. So if we are a little bit smarter and we make a little bit better choices, it decreases our chances of getting sick. That's what all the statistics and all the data show us. You with me? Yes. Okay, so prevention is the key, number one. Preventing illness, all types, is the answer. Our minds work in the opposite direction. The culture, the society, the way we live, all our actions are based on treating a sickness and treating a disease when we get sick because of a simple thought that we're fine because we don't feel anything. I promise you that that is the wrong way to go about it. Thinking that the human body can take and handle every single stress, put in every single toxin, do every single thing we possibly can to it, and then act like we're shocked when we get sick one day. When statistically, we're all getting sick from something. If we keep living the way we're living. So we have to make some changes. And my bottom line message, if there's nothing else that you get from tonight, from all the details of things that we're going to discuss, is, is that tiny little changes right now, are going to make huge differences for you two years, three years, four years, five years, or maybe 15 minutes from now. We don't know. Because we don't ever know when we're going to get the diagnosis, right? But we can't wait till we feel it. And one of the lines I said earlier was at that class speaking in front of these Dominion Power group of people, amazing group. And I was sitting there and I said, you know, somebody asked a question. I said, you know, we all want to eat a salad after we have a heart attack. And it just kind of came out of my mouth. And I was like, that's a great line. <laughs> you know? <coughs> Nobody, everybody's like, yeah, oh no, I had a heart attack and I survived, so now I'm going to change my diet. But our minds aren't like, what do I have to do so I don't get a heart attack in the first place? Heart disease or cancer or any of them. Diabetes, all of it. So, prevention is the key. Diet, exercise, and state of mind are things we're going to talk about and we're going to be addressing here when we do the class. A real health care crisis is how we change unhealthy habits that we have to not get into a crisis with our health. The health care crisis is not the insurance company, it's not how much money we pay, it's not what doctors charge, it's not the issue. It's an issue. I get it. It's an issue. But it's not our health care crisis. Our true health care crisis is that we make decisions that create most of our diseases and sickness that shorten our life. The number one leading cause of death, a good friend of mine likes to say all the time, is stupidity, is ignorance. It's us making poor choices and poor decisions every day, multiple times a day with the things that we do by choosing not to exercise because we don't feel like it because our show is on. 
who cares? Record it, come back in 15, 20 minutes and watch it. Just, right? We have enough technology that we can make these types of decisions. Information, which I'm going to give you tonight to help you make better decisions, hopefully, from the minute you walk out the door today. Taking an action on that information, not just going, that was a nice class, and then tomorrow not doing anything different. And then, of course, repetition to create a new healthy habit. So anybody in here has been like, you know, i got to work out, i got to exercise, and you're like, I don't feel like it, I don't really want to go, I'm tired, you really, actually you're tired because you're not exercising, right, by the way, so I don't feel like it, and then you go, and then you just finally something happens, it motivates you, it gives you just the strength to go for a walk, or do something nice, and it's a beautiful day, and I walk around the block, and you come back and say, well, I feel kind of good, I feel kind of good, maybe I'll do that again tomorrow. So you had information, you took action, now you need repetition. So now you're two or three weeks in. Have you ever experienced like, nothing better get in the way of my exercise? <laughs> right? You get to that point where you're like, I'm exercising, I'm feeling great, and you get kind of angry when something pops up and screws up your exercise program. Anybody feel that? You haven't gotten there yet, thank you. We gotta, we gotta work on that. We'll work on that. We need more repetition. Because <laughs> I'm like that. I'm like, I don't want to feel like it. I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it when I'm not exercising. But once I get going, it's like, don't just, everything's got to get out of my way. Because I feel so good when I'm exercising that nothing's going to stop me from exercising. And then I wonder to myself, why do I ever let anything get in my way to stop me from exercising? And let me get into these little ruts of falling out of it and then get back into it again and feeling great. So, cancer. What is it? On the most simplest of simple levels, because like I said before we even started the class tonight, it's complicated. But on the most simplest levels, inside of cells are what we call the nucleus. Inside that nucleus is what we have chromosomes. Everybody know what chromosomes are, right? And DNA, that's what helps the cell develop into another living cell that looks just like it when it gets tired and it gets old. If we stress a cell, long enough and over and over and over and hard enough it starts to damage the DNA inside so when it divides replicates makes a new cell that cell could be a damaged cell if that damaged cell starts to produce more damaged cells like itself and forms a group of these damaged cells growing and multiplying inside of us that's what we call cancer Okay, that's as simple as I can make it. Stress, on some level, damages the DNA, making us make a cell that's not the same as the cell that was there before. There's characteristics about these cells that are critical for us to understand. And I put together this beautiful thing, which I hope none of you can read, because I'm standing right in front of it and I can't see it. <laughs> And I was really disappointed because I think I'd made this great presentation. And then I went up and I pulled it up this morning and I was like, ah, nobody can read that. So okay. I'm going to go over just a couple of bullet points for you. Number one, it's explaining the difference in the characteristics of a normal cell and a cancer cell. A normal cell has a certain shape to it that's going to be, say, let's say, round. Okay? Has a cell membrane. That cell membrane receives messages all the time telling that cell how to function and how to work. Cancer cells don't need messages. They're independent. They do whatever they feel like on their own in their own little group. So no matter what stimulus the brain may send to those cells, most of the time it doesn't get there. They don't even have nerve endings to them. They're doing their own thing. They're not going and jiving with all the other cells around them. Okay? They also this is important, multiply at a much faster rate than a regular cell. Because their only job is to really multiply and make more of themselves. Okay? Cool thing is, they don't like oxygen. This is important. They don't like oxygen much. They don't need a lot of oxygen. All they're doing is making another cell. They're not performing some bodily function that requires a tremendous amount of energy. 
All they want to do is just make another one of themselves, a copy of themselves. So I want you to hold on to that thought. They don't like oxygen very much. Okay? So one of the things they do really love, sugar. They love glucose and love sugar. And the more sugar we have available in our bodies, the faster they can divide and grow. They don't like oxygen. They really like sugar. And they run all by themselves, independent of what the nervous system tells them to do. Okay? That's important. Hold on to those. So, how we eat might be important, yes? Eating food is stressful to the body the way we eat. So, I have done my stress classes. Some of you maybe have been to my stress class in the past, and you know that I contend that right now is the single, solitary, most stressful time that a human being has ever lived in. And why I say that is, for example, we could say, well, in the past there was wars. We're at war all the time. We don't even watch the news. We don't care. It's a war. There's like five wars going on right now, right? We don't, I don't know. It's like no big deal. We become numb to it. There's horrible things happening and murders and all this stuff, all this chaos, all these things. We can only stay mad for like 15 minutes about something. Because there's another thing to be worried about and another thing to be stressed out about 15 minutes later that makes us forget about the thing we were stressed out about 15 minutes ago. It's almost a constant stressful environment that we're trying to survive in. And then we take the changes that have occurred in our culture. Look at what's happened with electronics. We're bombarded with things like Facebook and things like this that give us all these messages that keeps us in contact with everybody. But man, I'll tell you what, 30 years ago, you didn't find out what was happening to your best friend or your aunt on the other side of the country until you got the letter, right? Or somebody called you on one of those phones with the dial things on it, right? I mean, it was like you didn't know every single thing everybody did every day and what they had for breakfast and lunch and dinner and what kind of mood they were in 20 minutes ago and 20 minutes from now and they can't sleep tonight and it pops up and rings and wakes you up because they got to tell the whole world that they're not sleeping right now. It's, Right? It's so invasive and so intrusive. It's great to be in touch, but it's not great how much it invades our lives and then it affects us and stresses us and our bodies. And our kids, what worries me the most, are growing up this way with that constant level of stimulus of used to be you did something good or you did something bad. Now they're up and down emotionally all day long with how many likes they got and who doesn't want to be their friend on Facebook anymore. These emotional attachments, it's affecting their brain chemistry and how their brains are working. A lot of studies going into this right now. So, add food in. That is not what food just was 20 years ago. Because food was not genetically modified in most of the foods that we ate. Not to mention most of the foods we then fed to the animals that got so sick that we have to load them up with antibiotics and hormones and all the other kind of stuff that we're ingesting when we eat. How many, anybody ever looked on a box of something and saw arsenic at the bottom of it? Ah, it's only a little bit. <laughs> but how many times a day are you exposed to that and how many different things that you ate? That one little bit adds up. There's so many chemicals. In fact, if you look I had this experience where I had an allergic reaction to a box of uh, noodle, cheesy, uh, broccoli, something. We were running around with the kids one night and the wife whipped it up and said, we need to do something quick and here, we're going to make this. And I woke up at like 3 o'clock in the morning just blown up with the, all the hives and having this major allergic reaction. And when I got to my doctor, he said, next time eat the box, you're better off. <laughs> And I thought it was like a joke, but I went home and I looked, and the whole side of the box was chemicals. I mean, somewhere in there, it might have said broccoli somewhere, so I don't know where the broccoli, it was way down at the bottom, but chemicals. It was all dyes and colors and preservatives and, 
everything that that food has to do to be processed. And we eat that all the time. Our bodies are constantly under stress. And then we don't exercise like we used to because we don't move in our society. So, more stress. We don't get to burn off those stress hormones that we naturally build up in a day. We just get stressed out and sit in front of a TV or a computer monitor or in our cars at a red light. There's no place for all that stuff to go. It just keeps breaking our bodies down. These are just some examples, but you get my point, yes? Mm -hmm. yes. Most stressful time ever. What did I say earlier happens to a cell if it gets stressed? The DNA starts to become damaged. The more it's stressed, the more chances of damaging that DNA. So when it does replicate cells, it's going to replicate more, higher chances of damaged cells. We have an immune system, T, lymph T lymphocytes, that go around and gobble up any cell that's not supposed to be in the body. Sometimes they miss a cell. We are creating thousands of damaged cells every day. There's some people that have some research that have put together postulating that we actually make millions of damaged cells every day. That these left white blood cells have to go around and gobble up. They're not just for infections. That are trying to keep all our healthy cells healthy and get rid of all the bad cells that don't belong in our body too. We need them. So how we eat, the less stressful the food, the better. The less stressful when we eat, the better. So one of the things we make a mistake of is sometimes maybe not eating for a long time and then having a giant meal. That's stressful. If you haven't eaten for a little while, it's much better to have, because there's some um, information telling us fasting, you know, like not eating from dinner time till lunch the next day may not necessarily be bad, but what we usually do is we're starving. We have a giant meal at lunch, and that's very stressful to the <coughs> blood sugar levels within our body and insulin and things like that. That's a problem. So we have to go with foods that are easier to digest, not too easy, because we don't want straight up sugar. Okay? And too much of anything is bad, yes? Moderation is good. Foods with colors are typically awesome for us. Things that are white are typically not. Free radicals from stress and antioxidants. So free radicals are, if you would imagine a piece of metal, and you've ever seen a rusty piece of metal, it's free radicals that damage that metal that creates the rust. What we're learning about the human body is, is that there are free radicals floating around from chemical processes that take place in our body that damage our bodies and cells inside. More stress. The way we help that is with what are called antioxidants. Antioxidants. So an oxidative stress is when things are breaking down. Antioxidating is good. Antioxidants are mostly vitamins. Sadly, our food supply is getting less and less and less vitamin concentration. So an apple, for example, does not have the same level of antioxidants that an apple had 20 years ago. Okay? So we need to add that somehow, some way, to try and keep that antioxidant level balanced and strong. We don't want any added sugar. We really don't want sugar. Right? So there's that. Fructose is a much, diff much more difficult sugar for our bodies to break down than glucose is. So high fructose corn syrup is harder on our body than glucose is. Does that make sense? So fructose, so we might find more fructose in a banana than in an apple, more glucose in an apple. Not necessarily saying that a banana is bad, but too much of it is a problem. And if you remember before, what did I say the cancer cells need to grow? Sugar. And what's in our foods more than ever before? Sugar. And what do we eat more of than ever before? Sugar. Yeah. Okay? So if we decrease our sugar levels, we can decrease our chances of having cancer cells. And if you're trying to battle cancer because you've been diagnosed with it, because you've gotten to that stage, God forbid, but if it does happen, the last thing you want to do is sit around drinking Pepsi or 
sweet tea or things that are loaded with sugar. <laughs> and that's a super giant, extra big goal. <laughs> Perfectly queued up for me. Thank you so much. <laughs> we won't say what's in there. That's a big, big thing of water. <laughs> So, we should eat six to nine servings of fruit and vegetables each day. I'm going to take a little slant on that and say that your veggies should be at least two to one, and that if you really only have one to two fruits a day, that's pretty good because of the sugar that's in the fruit, and not because the fruit is bad, because you're really getting good nutrients and some fiber, which is good, but if you get too much, you get too much, and if you've already got too much sugar in your diet, then you're just getting more sugar, which is more damaging than the couple of extra good nutrients that are in it. Vegetables are low in sugar. It was not an earthquake. It was a foam roller hitting the camera. <laughs> For those of you who watch it later, just in case we can't edit that out. <laughs> so vegetables are high in fiber. So even though they may have some sugar in like a carrot, it's got a lot of glucose, a lot of sugar, but it's loaded with vitamin A, which is so powerful and so good for our bodies and yet it's got a lot of fiber naturally in it so even though you get it it very slowly gets that sugar into your bloodstream not like and the sugar just pours into your bloodstream right food can be our best medicine if we use it right so one cool paper came out so we're starting to have a, a cool like phenomena occurring right now. So the American Cancer Treatments, uh, Treatment Centers of America, I'm saying it wrong, but whatever, but you guys know what I'm talking about. Yes, you've seen the commercials. And stuff. So they've been coming to our chiropractic conventions and they're saying, guys, we're getting like these really cool results by having chiropractors adjust our patients that we're treating with cancer and acupuncture and you know, we're doing all this diet and meditation and yoga and we're doing all these healthy things. And we're getting much better statistical data than people who are just doing chemotherapy, right? And so we're like, hey, cool. So they're do doing all this research. We go back and we find this research that was done many, many years ago, and then they went back and reproduced it again, and some doctors got together and they reproduced again. So I'm going to talk about some chemicals. So serum thiol, not that you really need to know what that is, but understand that it is what repairs our DNA in our body. So if our DNA has been damaged within a cell, if you have serum thiol floating around, it's going to come and attach the DNA and help it repair itself. Incredibly oversimplified explanation, by the way. So, it would make sense, they postulate, that if we have higher serum thiol levels in our body, that we have a higher chance of repairing our damaged cells. Common sense, right? So this is what they did. So they said, well, what happens when you go to the chiropractor? Let's just see. So they did this thing, and they went to this study, and this is what happened. So they took people who were sick, and their average serum thiol level was around 40 in their blood. They took people who were under three months of chiropractic care, and they said, oh, there it's much higher than people who are sick. And then they took people who are under what we like to call wellness care in chiropractic. They've been getting adjusted. They're not necessarily in pain. They're just getting adjusted to keep their bodies healthy, keep their brain and nervous system communicating with their cells. Remember? They need that cell membrane, nerve endings, telling them what to do, not off on their own, doing their own thing, right? Remember I brought that up earlier? So they found that the highest serum thiol levels almost double what the sick person has in their body is what patients who are under at least six months of chiropractic care have compared to the people who are sick and people who are just healthy but only under a couple months of chiropractic care. Pretty interesting study. Yes? Yes. You have a higher level, potentially, of repairing your DNA if your body's healthier. Cool, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> Kind of cool to be a chiropractor right now. <laughs> Just saying. So here's some fun foods. Some of my favorite superfoods. Garlic. Yes. Everybody re recognize that? Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I was I was so under the weather back in February. You know, I'm around people all the time, right? Like a lot of them, every day. 
And uh, you know, we got into flu season. I have not had a flu shot, and I can't even tell you when, because my immune system just naturally adapts to what's around me all the time. I don't need it. I argue with my medical doctor about it every year. Haven't gotten the flu since I don't remember when. 15, 20 years ago, actually, when I last got the flu shot, was the sickest I've been in many, many, many years. And that's when I said never again. So anyway, garlic. It's really good. So my wife says, I'm going to make you some chicken soup. You know, you're not feeling so good. I'm going to put some garlic in it. I didn't know there was like 50 cloves of garlic that she mashed up into the soup. Right? <laughs> and I, so I was, I was afraid because I was, knew I was going to come to work the next day. And feel, I'm feeling great. And everybody was like, ooh, the eyes were burning. <laughs> but I felt good. <laughs> so, I mean, it knocked this stuff out of me just overnight. It was just amazing what garlic can do. And it's a huge, powerful stimulator for your immune system um, and, and your digestive system. And that's uh, most of, do we, do we have anybody notice that digestive issues are on the rise? Here's my favorite commercial, the one with the guy. Who's the, who's the comedian? Um, he's the, 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 oh, oh, do you remember? The comedian, he does the commercial for, I forget, I can't remember the purple Charlie pill. Yeah. Oh, no. Nexium? But he, huh? Is it Nexium? Yeah, yeah. Larry the Cable Guy? Larry the Cable Guy. And he's out there, he's riding the jet ski around, and we see this, and it goes through like this ring of fire, and, and he's like, you know, yeah, I know, it was burning, and the sensation in your stomach, and, but if you just take next to him, and then he's standing there with this big, like, turkey leg, spicy turkey leg, you know, I'm thinking to myself, well, I think on some level, your body's probably saying you shouldn't eat that. <laughs> Not, let's just go take a pill and keep eating the thing that's making me sick, so I can just keep yeah. getting sick, but I can't feel myself getting sick because I'm taking the pill. Doesn't it? Right? Mm -hmm. So, digestive issues are on the rise because food's just changing faster than our bodies have a chance to adapt to it. So, helps the digestive system out. We re I recommend at least a clove a day in your foods. Berries, a handful, loaded with antioxidants. Antioxidants help to protect our cells from free radical damage. Mentioned that before. God, look at that. Is there anything white in there? No, color. Color is your vitamins, it's your nutrients. That's what makes these things have the color that they have. Things that are colorful are healthy, okay? It can slow, actually been shown in some studies to slow down the spread of cancer just by eating one handful of berries a day. Interesting, yeah? Another research studies out. Tomatoes contain lycopene, helps to protect the DNA, much like the serum thiol, tomatoes are good. And especially for men, because it helps with prostate cancer, it's been shown to have people who eat more, men who eat more tomatoes have less chances of having prostate cancer. And guess what? Sauce still counts. So sometimes when you cook certain foods and vegetables, you lose the healthy nutrient that's inside of it from the cooking process, right? whether it's because it's on a low simmer for six hours, I don't know what to, I mean, I don't know, but it, it doesn't damage it. And sauce is still contained, the lycopene's still there, even in sauce. And for some people who are into the Italian thing, it can also be called gravy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my, my friend of mine is Italian, the, the husband and wife, they do posts all the time, sauce, gravy, sauce, gravy. <laughs> so, cruciferous vegetables. I just like saying cruciferous. <laughs> That's pretty fun, right? So they are the green vegetables, a lot of them green, but they're more of the flowering type of vegetables. Um, the broccolis, the cauliflowers, things like that, cabbage, Brussels sprouts. I, you know, I hated Brussels sprouts when I was a kid. Now I like love them. I don't know why, but I just think they're good. Cauliflower is still like whatever. It doesn't taste like much. Uh, but it not only protects your DNA, but destroys free radicals and has been shown to actually destroy cancer cells in the body. Would you want to eat that? I want to eat that. Yeah? Right? Good stuff. Veggies. Green leafy vegetables. Spinach, kale, collards. They contain beta carotene and lutein and protect your cells and DNA. Again, protect our cells and DNA. Protect them, not damage them because they're stressful to the system. Make sense? Okay. Red grapes. Anybody know anything really cool we make with red grapes? Wine. Red wine. Okay. So, 
in the skin of the red grape is resveratrol. Resveratrol is for, right now, one of the most powerful natural antioxidants that we know about. There's always something coming out, um, usually in the form of a multi-level marketed juice or a capsule or something that's a better, uh, more powerful than resveratrol, and then it's around for a couple of years. People try and go to your door and sell it to you and get you to sign up for their multi-level marketing program, and then a couple of years later, it's gone. And then there's a new one. And then they start their chains all over again. Bottom line, resveratrol, super powerful, one of the most powerful that's out there, and it gets preserved in the process of making the wine. So even though you know it's wine, it still has resveratrol in it. Very important. One of the last things we'll talk about about food, green tea seems to be having some great research studies coming out about it, and turmeric, I think probably are we at a point where almost everybody's kind of heard about this nowadays? I would say one of my favorite vitamins we're going to talk about in a second, but and turmeric are probably two of the most important things that you should have somewhere in your diet and with your vitamins and supplements and everything else because it helps reduce inflammation on the whole. So that means it's going to help you with your joints with arthritis. It's going to help you with damage to your arteries from cardiovascular disease. It's going to help you with, you know, decrease your chances of having cancer. Tons of research coming out about this stuff. It's an amazing herb. And natural in some cultures like India and stuff like that, just use it in their food. It's what they cook with. So vitamin D3, I'm gonna do this quick because I do an entire class on D3, okay? If you wanna see that, come back. We'll have that up on the YouTube also, if you can't make it. But has been shown to decrease all cancers by 77% on average. Especially powerful, preventing breast cancer. One study shows us that a 90% decrease in women having chances of getting breast cancer if they only raise their levels to 40. 40 is not even normal. 50 to 70 is normal. We are in an epidemic in our culture of low vitamin D3. It's made with sunshine. It converts our cells to be able to make it. If we don't get sunshine, we don't make it. We all work in offices, closed doors, in front of computer screens. The light from your computer screen does not make D3. <laughs> Fluorescent lights in an office building do not make D3. Okay? we got to have sunshine. When we go out in the sun, we're also afraid of skin cancer. We load up on suntan lotions and these types of things to prevent ourselves from getting skin cancer, which blocks our ability to make D3. I've had people coming in and getting tested and going to their doctor, coming back, and their levels are like 9. I mean, it's just like I don't know how they're alive. I mean, it's, in, it's, in, it's incredible how low we are in this. And then it is shown to be, at, you can just get it to 40, you have a 90% chance of less chance of having breast cancer. One study, it's small, but there are close to 30,000 research studies that have been done on this vitamin alone because of bone density and its ability to take calcium into the bone. And we're really low on D3, and osteoporosis is a big problem. Shock, right? This is an issue. It's a huge, huge, huge issue. And we're talking about cancer, so we're going to stick with that. 50 to 70 is the healthiest. We're so bad that we now lowered it to say between 30 and 50 is low normal. That's what they call it now. Low normal. It's not normal. It's outside of normal. It's not good. Your body needs to be between 50 and 70. The stuff that we have up front, it's drops for those of us who can't get out in the sun. I keep it on my desk because when I'm here and inside all day like today, everybody tell me how beautiful it is. <laughs> so, I'm okay. And how it could have just been all day. Everybody, every single person was, it's just beautiful outside. And I'm like, great. <laughs> so anyway, so I'm going to get out tonight. I'm not going to get any sun. So I hit my couple of drops. has to be in an oil form. You want a good product. You don't want to buy junk in a capsule that's not going to be absorbed in the body, not be able to be utilized, or as I've slurred high and low to find a good one we got a great one so if you want to talk to me more about that later we can but it's we got to get these levels right you should be guarding every single time you go to your doctor to get tested you should be making sure your d3 gets tested it's that important of a vitamin okay thousands of research studies i already mentioned so oxygen how do we get oxygen to ourselves <laughs> cells I'm going to give you a hint. Can we read that? We exercise. We don't breathe deep. 
We don't get oxygen to parts of our body. We don't get the blood flowing, carrying oxygenated blood to our body. We sit. We sit in front of computers all day. We sit in front of the TV because we're brain tired from being in front of the computer all day, not physically tired. And then we go to bed because we're tired. Maybe. Sometimes we fall asleep in our chairs because our brains are so tired from being in front of the computer all day. We don't exercise. We don't move. This body is designed to function because of movement. We have joints. We have muscles. We have so many joints and so many muscles and so many things inside because everything is based on us moving. That's how we get the blood around. And we have to be able to take a deep breath and get oxygen into our brains and in and around our cells. Cancer cells don't like exercise. Great study just came out recently, I didn't even get a chance to get it in here, about people trying to recover. They have 50 to 70 percent with colon cancers, breast cancers, and all this kind of stuff. If they exercised after their diagnosis and, would, and beat the cancer, the people who exercised had less, that much less recurrence. If they exercised, one difference, not necessarily changing their diet. Worst thing I think I've ever heard as a doctor is when a patient came and told me a couple of years ago that she had beaten cancer. And her doctor said, you can now go back to living exactly the way you lived before. Whoa. I mean, my face got red. I could feel my blood pressure just going up into my head. I thought it was just going to, I thought it was just going to talk about stress. I was so stressed out when I heard that statement. I said, don't you think any of the decisions that you made before were what led you to have cancer in the first place? Maybe you shouldn't do everything exactly the same as you did before. And she was like, oh, yeah. that's, that's pretty good right there. That's good stuff. Yeah, you're right. I shouldn't, should I? You know, it was like, well, yeah, well, well how would you, who would say that? You, know, you just, uh, you beat the, you know, get, let's go right back and start smoking and drinking and, you know, not sleeping and, you know, right? No. It doesn't make any sense. So, last thing we're going to go over here real quick. 23,000 people studied. Internals, Archives of Medicine, 2009, came out. Four simple behaviors, not smoking, exercising three and a half hours a week, eating a healthy diet, maintaining a healthy weight. You know, we talk about BMI and stuff like that, but 93% of all diabetes could be prevented, 81% of all heart attacks could be prevented, 50% of all strokes could be prevented, and 38% of all cancers could be prevented. That's a big study, 23,000 people. That's huge. That's not like, oh, you know, 2000, that's like really good for a research study in medicine. There's 23,000 people. I mean, now diabetes is bad. Our biggest issue that's coming up is Alzheimer's, and Alzheimer's is now getting ready to be categorized as type 3 diabetes because it's that closely linked to that. And I've, every one of us has seen the commercials for the diabetes medicines that helps decrease the heart attacks, right? Because they're linked, they're together. What does this all have in common? Sugar! Stop eating sugar! But I love it. I know. It actually <laughs> tickles all the dopamine receptors in your brain. It's, there's some studies that aren't there saying it's more powerful than heroin as an addiction device. Just saying. This is my favorite quote. When you have your health, you have a thousand dreams. But when you lose your health, i got to fix that slide. When you lose your health, you only have one. Anybody who's ever gotten sick, there's only one thing they want, and that's their health back. It's the most important thing we have. Don't treat it like it's not. Okay? Good. I'm all fired up. I'm going to close on that note. <laughs> Thank you all for coming this evening. I appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank you for watching our video. If you like what you saw, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Yeah, and like us on Facebook. There's always a lot of information also on our website at rosemontchiropractic.com.